this is a, a real honor and treat. Uh, uh, four or so years ago, five years ago, uh, I, um, uh, Ariel Kinnan came uh, back from her Code for America uh, a fellowship uh, and was able to join the, the mayor's office and uh, teamed up with uh, Matt Klein, who was the executive director of Blue Ridge. And they said, we're going to bring civic service uh, into New York City government. And I was just like, whoa. Uh, and was, you know, just really excited to figure out like how they were going to do it. Uh, and it was great that it was embedded into the mayor's office of economic opportunity, now known as NYC Opportunity. Um, and what they've been able to accomplish over the last four years is really amazing. Um, so if you were here for the NYC planning conversation of how New York City planning is essentially embedding and infusing a whole variety of modern technology into agency operations, NYC service design and NYC opportunity is looking to do the same thing with design and, and service service design thinking uh, across the city. And it's a real uh, amazing uh, fact that we have our tax dollars helping support uh, the future of New York City government. Uh, and I really think that civic service design is the future of how our government services are going to be rendered because, uh, uh, and uh, we have five members of that team here to talk about the amazing things that they've been working on. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to the NYC Opportunity and the civic service design team. Thank you. What's up, everybody? Um, thanks for joining us today. I did not get a chance to go upstairs, so I'm sad I missed that. Apparently, it's really cool. Um, so thank you all for joining. Uh, my name's Tim Reitzis. I'm a designer at the Service Design Studio at the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Uh, I'm joined by my colleagues, Mari Nakano, our Deputy Director at the Service Design Studio, Song Hia, our Product Manager, who manages Access NYC, Ooh. Uh, Devin Hurth, a uh, front-end developer who's worked on Access NYC as well, and Julius, who is uh, our esteemed colleague from the Public Engagement Unit, who we work with closely on a product that we'll be talking to you guys about today. Uh, before we dive in and talk to you all about the Service Design Studio, just want to kind of show of hands, who all in the audience is a designer? Raise your hand. Technologist? works in government, works, and for those non-designers, works with design in some capacity. Okay, cool, a lot of design familiarity in the room. That's awesome. Uh, so as Noel said, uh, the Service Design Studio is part of the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Uh, our office is dedicated to using evidence and innovation to address issues of equity and poverty in the city. Uh, we have six different teams in our office. Uh, we like to call them our six superpowers. Uh, today we're gonna be focusing mostly on talking about our service design studio team and how we work closely with our digital product team. So what is the service design studio? Uh, we officially launched in October, although we have been doing this kind of work for about four years, like Noel said, our official launch was last October. Uh, we are an internal resource available to New York City agencies and offices to help them use design to design and deliver uh, products and services for New Yorkers. And what's our mission? Our mission is to make public services more effective and accessible for all New Yorkers. It's a big, bold statement, and what does that really look like? So we came up with a set of principles to kind of ground that mission. Um, we believe that public services should all be, uh, that people should be at the center of the designs of those programs and services. Uh, all services should be tested for and prototyped for usability. Uh, we often hear the word prototype and we think digital products, uh, but we prototype and test all services, so digital, uh, physical, they can be conversations, service interactions, communication materials, you name it, we test it. Um, our services should be accessible to all, so we like to work on things that are, uh, meet the standards of accessibility that the city's laid out, and equi equitably distributed. Uh, so we believe that uh, public services should be just as good, dignified, uh, and provide the same sort of help that people can get if they were to buy services on the open market. 
Um, that's a, a, another lofty goal, but that's what we're here to do. Um, and we also believe that services should be rigorously tested and evaluated for effectiveness and impact. Um, that kind of goes without saying, but uh, evaluation is a big part of, of the way we think about design and our office writ large thinks about design too. Uh, so we call our practice, as Noel alluded to, civic service design. So uh, what is civic service design? Again, a show of hands. Who all is familiar with the term service design? Okay, cool. Uh, so really service design means that we look for solutions that are rooted in the holistic experience of people that uh, are affected by the services that we're working on. Uh, and we believe that design isn't just about how something looks. Design for us is really about how things work. So people, process, information, and technology uh, are all the things we look at that go into the work that we do. Now, as designers, we want to solve all the challenges. Um, and there's a lot of them out there. But you know, we have a city of 8.5 million people, about 300,000 public servants across 70 agencies. And we are a team of five. Uh, so we can't possibly work on all those things. We have limited capacity, um, which is why our other goal outside of working on projects and direct service delivery is to build design capacity inside city government. So we want to provide tools and support for non-designers and those design-curious public servants so that they can use design to tackle the complex problems and challenges that they're working on in new ways. So here are some of the ways that we're doing that. Um, we have uh, tools and tactics. So a, a toolkit that Mari will talk about in a minute uh, is one of those supports. Uh, we host weekly office hours at our studio in downtown Brooklyn. I will talk a little bit about that after Mari. Um, we hold regular events for public servants, design curious public servants. Uh, we're working on a, a design curriculum for public servants as well that we'll be kind of uh, launching later this year. Uh, we're also doing something called the Designing for Opportunity Partnership, which you'll hear a little bit more about later in this talk as well, where we're really fully engaging with an agency partner on a 12-month uh, service design project. And then we work really closely with our NYC Opportunity digital product team, who are represented, well represented here uh, as well. And you'll hear some about that too. Uh, so I'll hand it off to Mari to talk about the tools and tactics. Thanks, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mari. Um, I'm the deputy director for the service design studio and just wanted to say that, you know, as a designer to be working for the city, um, I'm, I'm just extremely proud to be in this position, um, to be working for the city and to really br bring design um, into the work that we're doing. I'm just gonna give you like a quick overview of some of the work that we're doing. So Tools and Tactics is um, a toolkit that um, that the Service Design Studio put out um, a little while ago and it comes in the form of a website, it comes in the form of a binder toolkit and it comes in a, um, in a small really cute field guidebook. Um, but those, all those tactics um, and all those tools are, um, these are the foundational pieces and these all tie back to um, the principles that Tim had brought up. Um, I'm not gonna go into these in too much depth but these, these don't have to be done linearly um, by agencies. These are different types of tactics that we really um, try to talk about, we really try to train folks with, we really try to like infuse that in the conversations that we're having when we're talking about initiatives, when we're talking about challenges that we have in the city. Um, the first one is really about setting the stage and just like really understanding your institutional knowledge and the research that you already have to understand what the challenges might be around your initiative. But the big one here is about talking to people. So this is something a lot we tend to skip sometimes, but really going out into the field, talking to residents, talking to service providers, um, public servants who are trying to deliver these products, talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, talking to them in groups. Um, we really emphasize this piece and we also try to build in different types of tools to help guide people to build those types of, re you know, the the research or the ways to talk to people. Um, and when, when you have all those kind of pieces together, you both understand sort of the quantitative information, but also the qualitative information. It's really important to understand people's fears or reservations about a service um, 
or what they might be getting into, and those really inform the end product at the end of the day. And so we take all that information to really connect the dots, to really map users' journeys, um, understand how many stakeholders are involved in some of these challenges and initiatives, um, so we can really understand what to focus on, because some of these things are huge. They can take years to really achieve, and so these those things really help sort of set strategic plans for a lot of our agencies. Um, and the other thing is trying things out. This is really in the vein of prototyping. So talking about how do we do lightweight prototyping of technologies, how do we do lightweight prototyping of services so that it's low cost, we don't waste the city's money, and really understand what is effective so that way we can continue to iterate and bring in some of the best services and continue to improve them. Now the big one is also on focusing on impact. Um, as you saw that you know designers don't know everything, um, but we are part of a big team um, of 60 folks that are um, you know, focused in uh, research and evaluation and understanding how to measure those things. And so by being reinforced by that bigger mayor's office of economic opportunity, we're able to really look at the work that we're doing to really understand what impact that's having now and what type of impact it can have um, on the, in the future as we create sustainable and scalable products. Um, so here's the website, check it out, nyc.gov slash service design. Um, we really try to put that awesome design, you know, into the aesthetic um, to really make government feel cool again. Um, you know, because it is. Um, and this is the field guidebook. So this is a small pocket book about this big. It's written in a way that's really approachable, that's easy to understand, something that you can read on your train ride home or have on your desk. Um, and that really just helps um, do that small stimulation of like how you might think for the day with the work that you're doing. And lastly, a toolkit. So this is, if you come to our office hours, um, is something that you can use as a workbook. These have templates in it. Those templates are also downloadable on our website, um, and those help people really work through um, some of these designerly tactics that we have. Um, and they're also written and um, they're designed on Word, actually, in a way, so you can just download, use those templates, um, rejig them for yourself, archive them in here so, to get you going. Tell me if I'm taking too long or talking too much. I'll let Tim take over and talk about office hours. Thanks, Mari. Uh, yeah, so Mari mentioned uh, office hours. Um, so we have uh, four slots a week that we open up uh, for public servants working in the city to come to our office, sit with us in our studio, uh, talk to us about the challenges that they're facing in their work, and how design can maybe support what they're doing. Uh, if you come to an office hour, you not only get our support, you get some swag, and we force you to take a picture in front of our design wall, and we share it here. Um, so, so far, we've had a total of 50 office hours since October 6th of last year. Um, we've sat with 128 public servants from across 25 different city agencies, uh, six other governments, um, and two different academic partners. So Office Hours is a chance for us to provide support to public servants in the city. Uh, it's also a chance for us to learn, um, as designers do, what people are struggling with, um, what kinds of support they're looking for from us so that we can iterate on our own process uh, and improve how we're supporting folks in government using design. Uh, so we take really good notes in office hours. We have a very extensive uh, Excel tracker where we keep a lot of data about this stuff. And as designers do, we took some time to unpack all of that data uh, and sort it out into uh, different patterns and find some themes so that we could better understand, like I said, people's challenges and the supports that they were looking for from us so that we could hopefully improve on the way that we're supporting them. Um, so some of the things that people were coming in with that we found, um, not going to read every one of these for the sake of time, but testing programs, creating enhancements, building digital products, um, getting buy-in from folks. Um, some of the, the kinds of support that they were asking for across those different kinds of project projects. Uh, embedding design into an RFP. This is a big one that we see pretty often. So people are really interested in human-centered design and how it can help their the program or service that they manage, uh, but they want it to be not just an add-on or an afterthought. How do you infuse that into the program that you're delivering um, 
and or if you're creating an RFP for kind of a version two of a program that you're already running, how do you build that into the RFP? Um, designing and conducting user research. This can be very um, difficult for people to grasp in a lightweight way. They often get uh, scared off by the term research and think that you have to dedicate a lot of time and money to it. So we really help people kind of demystify that and get them going in, in really lightweight ways. Um, I mentioned getting stakeholder buy-in, iterating, iterating from a version one to a version two, and working with outside design vendors as well. Um, so I started talking about some of the stuff that we're doing to support these folks. Um, so implementing service design, I mentioned kind of the demystification and operalization of uh, some of our design tools and tactics. Um, so really getting, pe getting people comfortable with and getting them started building research plans and thinking about how to do user research in lightweight ways. Uh, building a stakeholder map, which is really just a list of all the people that uh, your service touches can be a really impactful thing for teams to do. Um, facilitating multi-stakeholder collaboration. This is something that a lot of teams come in wanting support for. Uh, we've started offering what we call a workshop workshop where we bring teams in for uh, follow-up office hours to run a workshop for them to help them create an agenda and facilitation tactics for them to run their own workshop and create buy-in across stakeholders. Um, and then just giving these teams who don't necessarily always have the time a space to come and sit and think strategically and think in new ways about the challenges that they're facing has been a huge impact. Um, if you are interested, we have an awesome blog post up about this, uh, civicservicedesign.com, designing our studio, reflections on our fall 2017 office hours. Sort of. Mari once again. All right. Yeah. The last thing, the last one is the big, is the big one. Like, um, we, we just uh, finished uh, wrapping up our, and picking our finalists for the Designing for Opportunity Challenge, which is a six to 12 month engagement that we will be um, getting into pretty soon uh, with a specific agency and working with them full time um, on their service delivery. I totally wish I could tell you about it, but it's still not out. But keep, you know what, follow us in about two or three weeks. We'll be putting out a press release about who we'll be working with. Um, but I just wanted to go through these quickly so we can get into um, Access NYC. But we blasted through this open, first open call, put it out for three weeks. We actually got, and, and this is sort of the design outputs that we did to just really um, get people to apply for it. On Twitter, the, the application process, we had a couple info sessions um, and an online application form. Um, and what we got were 15 applications within those three weeks. Um, and most of, many of them had previously engaged with us through the office hours, through just knowing us, coming to design forums and talks. So we, we saw that as like a really positive thing. But, and the other awesome thing was just a lot of folks came in with like really new initiatives um, that they thought maybe we could have um, a hand in participating in. Um, and these are the different types of themes that came out. So everybody really wanted access to better services. Um, and this is a big one for us. Um, there's huge leadership buy-in to work with a service design studio. So letters from commissioners and deputy commissioners um, attached to these applications were huge. And that really let us know that there were people high up that really believed in working with us together. Um, this is us evaluating the rubric and evaluating the different applications. Um, we took sem four semifinalists through each through a three-hour designerly workshop process to frame their challenge, to go really deep into the specifics about um, their stakeholders and the journeys of their users, and that really helped inform us um, which one is was design ready, which one we felt that had the those design complexities that we felt that we could tackle with them. Um, this is, and then this is Tim and Emily running one of those workshops and doing a uh, user journey mapping. And so you could just kind of see that. Uh, but I'll stop there. You get the idea. So you can also check that out on civicservicedesign.com to read about our process. And I'll let Song take it away and talk a little bit about Access NYC. Cool. Thanks. So today, we're going to talk about prototype-driven product development in government and how that's worked for our team at NYC Opportunity. We'll go through some of the initial design and development and research process for the Access NYC eligibility screener, 
which we put together and created with the help of the public engagement unit. It's a new product that we're planning to launch at the end of the month. But first, I'm Song Hia. Again, I'm a product manager with Access NYC. It's a mobile-friendly front door to the city's benefits and resources. It features a 10-step eligibility screening program that determines the eligibility for 31 different benefits programs. It features comprehensive information for 40 different programs, including things like how to get help, basic details, required documentation, important dates, and it's available in 11 different languages. It also features an interactive map featuring service centers where folks can actually show up in person and get assistance with these programs. You can check it out at nyc.gov access nyc. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Julius Goldberg-Lewis. I'm with the New York City Public Engagement Unit. We're housed within uh, HRA DSS. Uh, our mission is to reorient the face of government. What that means is proactively doing outreach to New Yorkers to connect them with city services and then case manage them through the process of accessing those services. So our vision is to meet people where they're at, whether that's outside their bodega, uh, at their front door, or just talking to them on the street. Uh, and once we've identified someone who you know, might need help accessing services, whether that's uh, help being secure in their housing, accessing uh, health insurance, things like that, we're going to case manage them through that process to ensure that they can navigate the sometimes difficult and confusing landscape of you know, getting those services. Right. So the public engagement unit is a personal entry point to the city, and Access NYC is a digital entry point to the city. We thought this would be a great opportunity to equip the public engagement unit with Access NYC as part of your toolkit to do things like facilitate holistic comprehensive screening for potential benefits and to also facilitate the process of applying and enrolling in these programs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the general framework that we use to develop this product, uh, referencing the Civic Service Design Toolkit that Tim and Mari mentioned earlier. You can find out a lot more about it online. But to get started, we had a bunch of initial uh, goals that we identified with PU leadership. At the end of the day, ultimately, we want to help support bridging and closing the enrollment gap for new girls in need, connecting them with uh, potential poverty alleviating programs. And this was going to entail us thinking about using this product in a very different context on different devices. This naturally led us to a lot of new questions. What are the constraints that PU specialists and their clients are dealing with? When might screening fit into case management? And what does an optimized screener look like? And what are we optimizing for? Um, given the sensitivity of the population and how resource and time uh, deprived they might be, we really wanted to proceed with thoughtfulness and sensitivity. Uh, we knew that traditional tech industry mantras like move fast and break stuff uh, weren't going to necessarily apply here. So the first step was uh, just talking with people. What did that look like? Um, this was a pretty hot day in August, and I really wish I had worn shorts. We spent a couple of days shadowing the public engagement unit as they walked up and down fourth floor walk-ups in different boroughs to proactively help residents with their tenant-related issues or help them enroll into rent freeze programs. And we learned a lot through this process, and we completely encourage all members of our product team to participate in some aspects of the research to really bring to life the context and the problems we're trying to solve and make our work make more sense to us. Um, here's some of our former apprentices, Victor and Stephanie, working with Amelia, a PU specialist, to do a card sorting exercise to get her perspective on the way questions are currently framed on Access NYC. All in all, we did a bunch of research bringing members of our team ranging from our developers, our designers, our training and outreach leads, our business and program analysts out into the field to participate in some aspect of research, whether it be going into the field, shadowing door knocking, going to events, and looking at what events look like from the perspective of clients and the specialists, um, listening to phone conversations that were part of case management, and doing lots of uh, interviews, whether they be formal or informal. And with all this information, we synthesized this into a number of initial themes that we knew were important and we wanted to explore a little bit more. One is context is everything. 
we, we heard that and we saw that for a lot of uh, folks, um, maybe having a conversation about your household composition, your finances, uh, your savings was going to be really difficult um, if you've just met someone who came uh, knocking at your door and wanted to help you. Uh, we knew that the PU specialists spent a lot of time and effort to really build the trust of the clients that they're serving. One problem at a time. We learned that for the PU specialists, um, and given the nature of the type of help they're providing, that introducing additional processes, additional programs, additional screening into that process um, was going to be a potential liability if they're already trying to case manage a client through a specific type of urgent issue. We learned, you, you use what you know. Um, we learned that for PU specialists, if they're making referrals to external agency programs or other benefit programs, they're typically doing this from a standpoint of familiarity and experience with that specific program so they can authoritatively ask questions and really help someone through that process. And so we thought that Access NYC might be a great way to bridge that gap of information. Here's a, an example of an early customer journey mapping uh, template that we used. Um, you can download something like this from our website. And I'll let Julius speak to the experience from his, his perspective. What did that look like? What did that feel like? And what did you maybe learn? Yeah, so as you can see from my thumbs up there, it was a successful journey mapping session that we did, <laughs> um, plus all the sticky notes. Uh, this was one of a few journey mapping sessions that we did um, at PEU with some of our specialists. That's Jerry on the right, who's one of our tenant support specialists. And what we did was really break down from, you know, staying in the office or about to be out in the field knocking doors through the resolution of a case, what we do and how, what steps we take to figure out, you know, what are the places that Access NYC can fit in, what are the needs that we still have, and, you know, figure out and get a little bit more specialist buy-in to say, okay, this is where we're doing research on programs, this is where we might run into roadblocks, and kind of put that all out for the Access NYC people who, you know, can take that back into their uh, team and see how this program can fit with our program. So after wrapping up our initial research, uh, we spent the next couple of weeks developing uh, and testing out a couple of ideas about how we might optimize the screener. One major hypothesis that we had was that by changing the flow of like what is a 10-step screening process into something um, on a single page that could be used on an iPad, which is what the PE specialists use, uh, would better reflect the sort of spontaneous nature of their conversations. Um, they'd be more familiar with the screener and be able to jump back and forth between different sections. And so we started off with clickable prototypes, um, testing and validating that main hypothesis, hypothesis, but also learning a lot of new things about um, the interaction outside of the screen, also uh, learning things about what information is going to be really important. How do we better prioritize the large amount of information that Access NYC presents? We basically learned this all through just making, testing, learning, and repeating the process a bunch of times. Over the course of about two and a half months, we made a clickable prototype, uh, two functional prototypes, and did user acceptance testing. And here is the side-by-side -side comparison of Access NYC on the left, and then on the right, we've got the current version of the new optimized screener for the public engagement unit that reflects more of a, a single page flow that's more customizable and more flexible. So through all of this, we, we learned a lot of things, a lot of really important things uh, about the context outside the screen. We learned about uh, the importance of framing and tablet fatigue and that Conducting the screening process might be better suited as a, as a collaborative process with the client. Instead of having a uh, an iPad in front of you and asking all these very personal questions, um, going through the process together with someone and having them actually see the questions that you're asking would make the process feel a lot more transparent. That time and prioritization were really important. We figured out a lot of different opportunities for rearranging the question flow, uh, as well as the ability to uh, triage down from the initial list of um, all the potential benefits that someone might be eligible for down to maybe the one or two most important urgent uh, programs that would make sense for someone to proceed with next. Um, a lot of folks aren't going to know this information off the top of their head, um, so we ended up developing a lot of cheat sheets so that the PU specialist would better be able to prepare their clients in advance um, for screening. And at the end of the day, uh, for a lot of people, paper is king. Um, 
we ended up developing paper templates that PU specialists could use and then hand off to a client at the end of a screening section or mail to them uh, if they were doing a screening over the phone. So we also learned a lot about our own working process as well by having retrospectives. Uh, we started new practices like developing Technical Tuesdays, an opportunity and space where our engineering team can ask more high-level questions about our process and frameworks with the rest of the team. Um, we wanted to start better defining what a prototype is. Um, at the end of the day, does this have to be something that's like functional? Like, what does that actually mean? Does it have to be production ready? We wanted to stop refactoring without this type of clarification. And we also wanted to continue our process of having design pinups with the rest of the team. So moving on to um, where we're at now, focusing on impact. Uh, we're currently in the process of operationalization, developing networks so that the PU specialists have contacts at agencies where they can get help, check in on statuses of applications, uh, developing training plans and materials, and refining this process. What does handoff look like? What does it mean when you've, trained some, uh, when you've screened someone over the phone versus when you've screened someone um, in person, and how do you follow up with them? So bringing this back to the goals at the end of the day, ultimately, the most important thing is really for us supporting bridging that gap. And so we're looking at measuring a couple of different numbers to see, you know, um, are we making an impact? What, what, what type of impact are we making? So at a high level, it includes things like measuring screener completion rates, enrollment rates, looking at how the tool is being adopted. Is our process in place? Does it all make sense? Is it easy to do in the context of the life of a, a PU specialist? And bring us to what's next. Uh, after launch, we're going to continue to do analysis, uh, interviews, provide support and iteration on this product. We're also thinking about scaling this product and process for additional service providers, other city agencies, and community-based organizations. We're also thinking about turning our rules engine, which is a system that actually um, lets folks know what programs they might be eligible for into a, an API. So you don't actually, in theory, need a screening process. If you've got the right data in a database, you can format it in such a way that we can determine eligibility without having to necessarily talk to people. And then finally, improving our, our practice, looking at our frameworks, our technology and tools, um, better being able to measure the things that we want to measure, and, and spoiler alert, um, thinking about a design system, which leads us to the next portion. All right. Well. Um... So the Access NYC PEU screener project was one of the first major products for our newly uh, developed design and tech uh, team. And um, as Song mentioned, we had a lot of findings from that. But one of the tw uh, things that we discovered about our internal practice was um, how design systems play a part in the management and extension of digital products. So our work was organized into two week long sprints where we ended up developing a live prototype where we prototyped in code. And we wanted to do that so that we could um, create features that could seamlessly be deployed without having to go through separate design and development cycles. Um, and this isn't keeping in line with the principles of the service design studio. Um, building for our end users, getting stakeholder buy-in, um, failing fast and iterating. Um, and what we had originally with Access NYC, um, it was an application that was launched in 2016. So by all means, it was a modern web application. Um, it's a single page web app um, that has an external service that um, evaluates eligibility criteria. Um, the program content is all managed on WordPress and to back up a little bit, that content is managed on Gather content, which is also fed into our Benefits API, which is another digital product that we manage. And the front end is all built in a, a tooling system that is uh, managed by Gulp. Um, but the project ended up being a lot more work because we were missing a few things. Um, for starters, we were mix missing flexible design patterns. Um, most of the po components that were already developed for Access NYC didn't work out of the box for Ac the PEU screener. Um, we were also missing a JavaScript web application framework for building new interfaces that were more data-driven. 
And the most important thing is that we were missing a way to talk about these patterns. Um, as a new team, we didn't have the common language to discuss what we could reuse um, on Access NYC for PEU. Um, but regardless, we were able to reimagine and repurpose Access NYC, as well as put in place methods to extend the product. And I think this quote captures um, design systems, or the definition of design systems really well, and it's from a book of the same title. Um, and the key here is that patterns are two things, um, or design systems are two things. They are patterns and uh, practices. Um, and patterns are repeating elements that we combine to create an interface. Things like user flows, interactions, buttons, text fields, icons, colors, etc. And the practices are how we choose to create, capture, and share those patterns, particularly when working with a team. Um, and digital products nowadays, whether they are private or public, are utilizing design systems to adapt to the rapidly changing environment of the web. Um, design systems help us break the cycle of thinking about web pages as static assets. Um, and this thinking helps product teams uh, collaborate, share, and deliver better services more effectively. And so by going through the PEU project, we had embraced design systems thinking by necessity. Um, and this meant that we could reuse uh, and repurpose elements of the application in new ways and scale it more easily. And so now we're taking it all the way by formalizing the common language around the patterns of our product. Um, as a team, we went through each component and discussed the naming convention and created new names that made sense to the entire team. And now with that agreed upon organizational method, we can map, map those names back to the source code, co excuse me, source code, plus add additional features such as a static site generator for displaying documentation on a web page. Um, and we've ported the pattern uh, library into a separate repository that can be plugged into other Access NYC products in the future. And some of the other things that we're thinking about with this pattern library is how we can integrate it into uh, design tools, particularly Sketch. Um, and that will help us bridge the design and development tooling gap. Um, but at some point, we have to ask ourselves, um, why go through all of this extra work? Um, well, our goal is to empower the team internally and uh, create something that can be shared. Um, we aren't exactly looking to create a new standard in design systems, um, but we hope others will find this example useful. Our guiding North Star is to reimagine access to health and human services, and we think that the design system is going to play a huge part in that. Um, and how New Yorkers navigate the journey of benefits access. And so with that, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, what can a design system do for you? If you have one, how do you use it? And uh, how could the Access NYC design system be useful to everyone? Thank you. I also want to make mention that we've opened up apprentices uh, excuse me, apprenticeships for uh, the summer. Uh, so go to uh, this website and uh, apply, please. Thanks. Time for the chairs? Yeah. And we're just like to open it up for questions and conversation. There's, um, and for the, regards to those apprenticeship programs, there's design, product management, and uh, development. I think there's a graphic design one that's coming out too, so. Something for everybody. Who's got questions besides Mr. Ashlock? Anyone? All right. Oh, hey. You haven't asked one yet. I know. Um, it's just a really basic question. When are your office hours? Oh, Tuesdays, Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons. Uh, if you go to, I'm sorry. Hold on, hold on. The internet. To our office hours are uh, Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons. Um, if you go to civicservicedesign.com, you'll find, a, we use Calendly as a way to schedule them. Uh, right now we're only doing office hours really with uh, folks that work in public service. So if you are, we're looking forward to talking to you for sure. We encourage everyone else here and out there to sign up as well. 
Uh, so I was just curious about the kind of like measurement um, and sort of validate part of the uh, like iterative process and whether there's any kind of systemic approach to doing uh, measurement and analysis, both in terms of traditional like user research, but also in terms of like more um, kind of like, you know, uh, implicit as opposed to explicit feedback, you know, like so with web analytics, you know, you can sort of instrument that type of thing, but maybe thinking more holistically, not just on web and digital, but sort of within like the context of service design blueprints, finding out where those opportunities are for uh, sort of having ongoing data collection analysis to do that iteration, not just as specific design sprints, but as like an ongoing process. Yeah. Song, you want to talk about some of the, you don't have to, um, <laughs> for, for access, because we're still, you're yes. still working on KPIs. Uh, yeah. And then I can talk about it from the design perspective. Sure, yeah. I mean, I'll let Tim talk about the design perspective and how we handled usability testing and how we made assumptions about um, features that we'd be implementing for essentially a team that didn't have any other options. You know, we're not making a consumer product at the end of the day. Um, we hope they're going to be using this tool and working really collaboratively with them to make things that are going to be useful and useful was our general approach. Um, in terms of metrics, uh, it's something that we're still very much figuring out as a new uh, team at the city, uh, exploring different measurement options, but at a high level, just identifying what are we trying to do at the end of the day, and how do different aspects of our digital products um, ladder up to our high-level goals or can serve as proxies, because data is a huge, um, I think, challenge from my perspective and the team's challenge. There's so many gaps, you know, um, with Access NYC, we can tell things like, you know, the percentage of people that started the screening process versus the percentage of people that completed the screening process, but at the end of the day, we still don't know things like, did this, this person successfully enroll in um, getting SNAP or um, getting their rent frozen? And there's so many things that happen outside the screen, and so with working with the public engagement unit, one big um, important piece of data for us is going to be able to start to connect the dots between what's happening with the screening process in a digital tool um, with the help of like human services and actually being able to tell um, how many people are actually successfully enrolling in, in, in products or sorry in uh, programs. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Yeah, I answered, like, hey, hey, hey. Uh, <laughs> For the web people. Uh, I would just love to talk with you all about this in more depth after sure. afterwards. I mean, I'm sort of like trying to see if we can sort of have like more of a well-defined sort of discipline around service design analytics as like a field. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll also add like we, uh, as a new, relatively new studio, um, we're engaging in a formal evaluation with the help of our NYC Opportunity Program and Evaluation Team on the studio itself. Um, so we just finalized a bid for that. Um, so we're excited. We're also looking at that as well. So yeah, catch us after. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, I think this is a big, I have, I have oh, one. <laughs> this, this is a big question that constantly comes up right now about how do you measure the impact of design in these spaces. Uh, it's very necessary practically speaking, to get funding, right? We're a small studio. We're also looking at how, if we, if we can measure these things, then will that then allow you know, more the scaling of design teams in agencies or making a bigger team for ourselves, which we'd love to have? Um, but but you know, having a formal evaluator come on is a big one, is a big step. We've never seen that before. But also looking at every, every sort of program we're doing, office hours, we are going through and looking at who's coming, what are their themes, is it even junior level, mid-level, senior level people coming in, evaluating those, even actually pulling pull quotes from the impressions of people to understand what they're thinking there. You know, and, and if there's any behavior change in, in the way they interact with us or how they're spreading it. Um, and the other thing is just really, you know, I call it design osmosis, but how can we track that in government? Um, how can you really see if there's the attitude of a person is more designerly, you know? And so that's difficult. It's very like quant qualitative, but we, we understand that and we're just for now capturing as much data as we can, even if it's minute and, and just tracking it. And then I think we'll, we'll start to be onto something. So yeah. Thank you. Um, so my question is about when you start working with an agency, maybe for the first time, how do you make sure that you're starting off on the right foot, if you will? Because I think service design is a pretty new concept, especially in government. And I think 
So many people who work in government might feel overwhelmed or intimidated by it, or sadly have the wrong impression of it, like designers just make PowerPoints look pretty or something like that. So how do you start off? Yeah, well, a big, a big part of... Hey, hold on. Change. No, 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 it's going to take too long. Okay. I think a, a big part of our role is educative um, as well as kind of programmatic. So uh, kind of demystifying the concept of service design and getting people to understand the real the value behind it is something that we're constantly doing. Um, so that's why we have so many touch points, office hours, our design forums, things like that. Um, we also, like Mari talked about, like we have a ton of interest from the commissioner, deputy commissioner level, which is really cool to see for us. It's very empowering uh, to see that kind of buy-in from the leadership level so far. Uh, it's just a matter of like, how do you like put that to use and operationalize it? Um, there's only, like I said earlier, there's only five of us. So um, the challenge is that we don't have the capacity. There's a need. Like we are seeing a, a need and a desire to, to use design in, in city government. Um, we just have to figure out a way to build the capacity. Yeah, and I think a small one with that <laughs> is a, all those varying levels um, is how we're really trying to disseminate what we're able to do. Um, and we do have prior case studies, which you can read um, on the civic service design um, website to understand how we've engaged in the past with agencies. But I think one of the other things is um, we're trying to celebrate and empower the people we work with. So one of the things that actually Tim initiated was um, articles like design champs. We've been actually interviewing folks that we really feel um, have that uh, incur like excitement and um, really asking them how they're using the tools and tactics that they've come across um, and to celebrate them. And I think by doing those things little by little, then that gives that really once one, we're giving permission to people to use these sort of these these ideas that maybe aren't so strict, right? You're, it's about breaking rules and being creative and all those things. So giving that permission that you can do that in government um, and and also just like really putting them forward. So we, we, we're there as public, we're serving the rest of our agency. So we don't, we don't try to be the one in the front that's like, oh, we're the design leaders, follow us. It's how can we help enhance you and get you to where you need to go, so. And we have a lot of great buy-in from people who have seen our amazing digital products that these guys are responsible for. Um, a lot of people come to our office hours, they're like, oh, Access NYC is amazing. Um, how did you do that? <laughs> so um, that helps too. Oh, hey. 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 Uh, first of all, I, I love that this exists, so you guys are awesome. Um, I was wondering, uh, did you guys pull any inspiration from other cities? Are there like established cities that, cities that have like a strong design culture or specifically civic service design? Um, Uh, New York City is obviously a very unique city, but how is New York City compared to other, like, even globally, like, how are they tackling civic service design and stuff? Do you, do you want to talk, Irva? Oh, you don't have a mic. I can start. I mean, the, the Dutch are awesome. The, the international, some of these international folks, like, the, like De Denmark, um, another, those guys are just kicking butt um, already. So we look up to them. Um, they have beautiful work out there. Uh, but at the same, at the same time, um, you know, civic, our service design studio is pro perhaps the first municipal service design studio in the nation. Um, so we we have a lot of pressure for that. But we, but we're really in New York in general, right? New York is like this kind of creative space that that puts out a lot of these sort of things first, right? So we have, we have a lot you know, of responsibility in that way, but we are really working closely with other um, government agencies in the US and in Canada and international abroad you know, um, to really um, understand what they're doing for us to exchange our tips and tricks with them um, so we can like do, move together. Uh, we don't want to silo ourselves and say, just do what we do. We're really trying, it's, it's nuanced too. We sit under the mayor's office of economic opportunity. So we have immediate, the immediate um, mission is or our work is focused on low and moderate income folks, whereas another um, design studio 
um, may be under a different part of their offices, right? So they have a little bit of a different mandate. But I think these sort of design, designerly tactics um, that have come from the design world are, are being applied in different ways. So we're in that space. But we also understand that that's a big challenge um, that is sort of our next step. And to all, also acknowledge our team just started together in October. So we, <laughs> we're, we're moving as fast as we can. Yeah. yeah, I think there's also like there are teams popping up around the same time as us across the country, Seattle, San Francisco, Austin. Um, come to mind, and there have been champions of like the civic design and civic tech space that come out of like Code for America. Um, Ariel, like Noel mentioned, the director and kind of the 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 person behind the studio um, came out of Code for America and has a big network of like-minded civic design and tech folks all across the country. Um, so yeah, I mean the work is out there. You can definitely find it. Is this, okay. Um, so maybe like along the same lines of all the stuff that you guys have been talking about, but um, I'm really curious and intrigued by the idea of like wanting to get at the like communities that you're trying to serve, which are majority like minority communities or low income communities. Um, and I'm wondering, cause you're mentioning a lot about working with government agencies, but I am curious if like part of like the like long-term planning is to also maybe work with like grassroots community groups and like nonprofits or like any like agencies like within that sector. Um, so a lot of, um Almost most of the direct service delivery done for human services in the city is done by their like CBOs. So agencies will manage and fund a lot of that work, but um, their boots on the ground are are those those teams. So uh, we want to help the agencies and offices supporting those CBOs um, support them in, in the right way for them, right through through using design. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Uh, as far as working directly, like we are part of the mayor's office and, and kind of our MO is working with the city. I don't know, actually, do you wanna add Yeah, to I can, that? I can yeah. take a little bit. Um, yeah, so I mean, a, a big part of this also was having the NYC Opportunity Team and the Design Studio Team shadowing our specialists when they're out in the field. And the people that they're speaking to are the people that you know we're trying to touch and trying to affect with this product. So they are people who, you know, have trouble making rent or don't uh, have health insurance and things like that. And those are the people that we're targeting. Um, so our specialists have also uh, kind of informed a little bit about how to make this product uh, a little bit more usable. So one of the things that we had talked about a lot was transferring from a linear screening to a kind of more flexible thing. Because when you're in a conversation with someone, you know, they're giving you information that isn't always fitting to this kind of linear model. So figuring out, you know, if they're kind of popping in or out or you're trying to call them over a sort set of a few days, what's the most important information you can glean to make sure that, you know, it's impacting them. And then also making sure that because a lot of people, you know, also know about these services already, how do you make sure that we're targeting, you know, the services that might they might not know about, they might not have accessed or, you know, might not uh, have gotten into in the past. In the back. Five minutes. Um, hey, I have a, a question about product management. So is um, product management, is, is there, like, can anyone speak to the landscape of product management within for the city? And is this, like, the, the kind of the same? Like, are you guys also, like, the product leaders for the city? Do you want a mic? You want to, oh, you have a mic. He's like, I'm thinking about this. I mean, that, that's a good question. Um, I joined the city about a little over a year ago, so I'm completely new to working with government, but I definitely come across a lot of folks who are trying to make change, dealing with very large problems, and thinking about how they can best make an impact in a lot of different ways. And I think, you know, product management. I'm still figuring out what that means. I think if you ask a lot of product managers, um, you'll get a lot of different answers. But I do think that um, within the landscape of the city, we're trying to do a lot of similar things. We're just using different vocabulary. If you're asking about like quote unquote like modern tech product management practice, um, my, my sense is that given the way I've seen the, the city develop technology and the sorts of constraints it's traditionally had, um, that it's, it's a relatively new practice within the city. If that answers, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I think it's a lot about translation, right? Like the design team is is there to help translate really complex ideas or or huge long-term initiatives in a way that can be simplified and understood by all the users, um, whether it's government jargon and us trying to translate that, or whether it's um, what the end user or um, someone, a resident might need. And, and really understanding that something that a resident might say is just as important as someone with government speak might say, you know, and putting that all and leveling that, you know. Um, I think from my experience, not having product managers on a team, it's been detrimental because you expect the UX designer to just tell the like development team that you're contracting to make the thing. And it's like there's this big moat in between of how to bridge those two together. And someone like Song is, is someone that can do that and get. And that actually, then at the end of the day, makes product scalable, makes it move more quickly. Um, and people like him can be on stage and, and talk about that, you know. So, and the fact that we have staff lines now for product managers is a huge. It, it says a lot, I think, about the city being open to bringing designers and product managers and all these sort of different people that normally aren't titled in the drop-down menu when you're trying to click like who should you know who are we here? So, yeah, it's definitely a, yeah. a new thing, but it's incredibly valuable, and we'd like to see more of it across the city. Yeah. Uh, going once, going twice, final. Oh, oh! Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure how to frame this as a question, but um, in the civic engagement um, group or panel that, that came up earlier, um, people were talking about how amazing it is that there's you know the open data movement, but what might the equivalent look like um, to reverse the model and have the data coming from average citizens, you know, to the city. And I wanted to, I thought that was such an interesting question and a really important one. And um, people talked about why people might not be engaging in that one, you know, the language barriers, the, the access barriers, um, something I'm sure you all encountered in your work. In addition to like just background barriers, immigrant populations, you know, fear around deportation and all that that's that's happening in the city. So I guess I wanted to ask that question to you as just, have you had thoughts, and, and i really amazed that you're five people, but for future iterations of kind of flipping the model and having the design come from your constituents and what that might look like. Yeah. I think that's the you know one of our the principles that we put up there is like uh, services should be designed by the people that receive deliver and and manage them and that's really like one of our the the things that we strive for um, is to bring those people into the process as early and often as possible so that there is that like sense not just a sense of but a, a real co-design and co-creation of services um, so you know one step at a time, but like we're, that's what we're after too. Yeah, and I think also like if we look r r way forward, you know, we're all about tra like transparency, right? And I think that when, when we, as we evolve these products, um, as we evolve the way we service, provide service design, how can that end user, how can that everyday New Yorker be able to tell us what they want right away, not going up and up and through all these other agencies and other partners and policymakers, which, are, which is really important. And I think that's our first, that's the big one we're trying to tackle right now. But could they just get, and could a mass of people be able to speak their voice, probably needing to do it anonymously because of these fears and things like that. But um, can they do that, and can that change policy? And I, I think that that's possible. Um, and so. And I, I'll add, like we had, we did a workshop with a, a team recently, and we were doing stakeholder mapping, and we have buckets of like who uses it, who delivers it, who governs it, and they had their their end user, their clients, in who uses it, but they kept saying, our dream is to have to put this group into the who governs it section. Yeah. So all that to say, like there are people out there working in government right now who have that same vision. Um, it's just about like how do we get there. Um, um, you, uh, we're we're at we're out of time. Um, uh, so, um, 
No, you can engage with them uh, afterward. We're going to be. We need to reset up for for the for the closing session, and we want to be prompt. And we have a time. We have we have to get out of here on time. Um, so uh, let's give this uh, these government service a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, it's not easy being a designer in government, I'm sure. Uh, people look at you like, what the f... Uh, so, um, if you want to engage with them, they're going to be in the cafe. Um, uh, we are going to quickly uh, change this room out for the closing session. We're going to have uh, John Paul Farmer, one of the sponsors, say some words, and then we're going to hopefully extract from you the last bit of energy that you have, so that way you can help us build a better road roadmap, uh, essentially a better policy document to advocate for the types of services that you've seen, the ideas that you've been able to engage in. We need to get that into the people's roadmap um, so that way we have four years of, uh, of solid advocacy ahead of us. Um, so uh, if you see any cans, you see any cups, that would be greatly appreciated. And we hope to see you back in this room in 15 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you.